Shalom to Arya Lightstone. Until yesterday, the Chief of Staff of U.S. Ambassador to Israel, David Friedman. Shalom, how are you? So first of all, tell us about your feelings as this mission is coming to an end. Uh, conflicted. Um, uh, we've left everything on the field, as they say. We've made every effort to advance the U.S.-Israel relationship as far as you can possibly advance it. Um, the more you get into the details, the more you know that there's more to do. And, uh, and I think we can be very proud of our accomplishments. Uh, but I think that it's bittersweet knowing that there is still more to accomplish and, and that we won't be here to accomplish that. So throughout these four years, there was a lot of talk about this unique friendship. How much was it really a friendship or was it mainly, you know, common interests? Oh, in between, in between the United States and Israel, as well as in between Ambassador Friedman, myself, and the state of Israel, uh, it's a love affair. And it's a love affair for lots of different reasons, but uh, primarily because we have so much in common, uh, and frankly, our faiths are so intertwined with one another. Uh, so yeah, that does mean that on occasion we'll have personalities that don't mesh and don't click. Uh, in the real world, when you have personalities that don't mesh and don't click, you can take your ball and you can go home. Uh, in this case, uh, you figure out how to make a way to make it work. Uh, it's a marriage, uh, and the goal is to make it as uh, as close and as everlasting and successful as you possibly can. And uh, I truly feel over the last four years, uh, we've had a honeymoon period, uh, but I feel like we've had an opportunity to raise some children uh, as well, and uh, and all of the ups and all of the downs. But but at the end of the day, enormous satisfaction. Uh, with the growth in the relationship. So how do you relate to those who say it wasn't a fair game? It was a love affair, as you call it. You guys were clearly pro-Israel. Uh, very confused even by the subject matter of the question. It's a quintessential American value to be pro-Israel. Uh, somebody who is not unapologetically uh, pro-Israel, I think one has to question their uh, pro-American bona fides. Now, that doesn't mean that you can't disagree with Israel. It doesn't mean that we can't question Israel. It doesn't mean that we don't question all of our allies, from the United Kingdom to Morocco to Japan uh, and above and beyond. Uh, we question and work with all of our allies because they're partners. Uh, Israelis are not Americans and Americans are not Israelis. Uh, but we work extremely closely together in order to benefit both of our countries. Uh, and the strides that we've taken uh, over the past four years uh, have created a safer, better, and more prosperous uh, region, not just for Israelis, but for Americans as well. Every decision we have made in the four years uh, that we sat here have been completely and totally from an American perspective. Uh, now, it happens to be it is fully in the interest of the United States of America uh, for us, A, to show no daylight in between us and Israel, but B, to promote Israel as the regional superpower that it is. It is fully and totally within our interest to be able to do that. Uh, and detracting from that, uh, is really acting against U.S. interests. So I, I, I reject the notion of the question. So do you think the words missed opportunity will be used when we look back at the Trump years as we enter and uh, start to experience the years of the Biden administration? Oh, I, I think that, I think that um, we're, we're li we, we lived through these past four years a generational, perhaps once in a multi-generational um, opportunity. And by definition, whatever was not accomplished is a missed opportunity. But it's not a missed opportunity exclusively for Israel or for its neighbors or for the region. It's also a missed opportunity for the United States of America. Uh, every chance you have to move the ball further down the field to strengthen its relationship uh, is an advantage and an opportunity for all of us. Um, never once do I recall being part of a conversation where we were advocating for something that was good for the U.S. and negative for Israel or good for Israel and negative for the US. Uh, almost every circumstance was a win-win. The difference was sometimes it was a quicker win for one versus the other. Uh, on occasion, one of our countries is a little bit more long-term uh, focused uh, than, than one of the other countries. So on occasion, it's a cultural difference, but certainly not a goal difference. And uh, if you look at the team that President Trump put together here, uh, starting with the Vice President, the Secretary of State, Mike Pompeo, Jared Kushner, Avi Berkowitz, uh, Ambassador Friedman. Uh, there will not be enough words written in history uh, to emphasize the impact that he has made. Uh, but our Secretary of the Energy, both of our Secretaries of the Energy, our Secretary of Veterans Affairs, uh, you name it. Uh, there is not a person in this administration who on their own would have been considered the hero of the U.S.-Israel relationship in any other administration going back to Harry Truman. 
any one of these people uh, would have been uh, the all-star of that entire administration. And this was an embarrassment to riches. And I apologize. I probably left out 25 people that have all come to the top of your head. Um, because you have a very strong pro-America administration uh, that understands that with promoting American values, you're promoting our values of our allies. Uh, this administration, starting with the president and, and, and led by Ambassador Friedman here, uh, and obviously our Secretary of State and Jared, uh, that promoting American values uh, involves standing uh, shoulder to shoulder with our allies and uh, unapologetically. And, and you can see what the results are. The results are a explosion of peace. Now, looking at the achievements, do you believe that they at least are eternal or even they can be taken back and reversed? At the very first Rosh Hashanah Haramat Kosit uh, toast that Ambassador Friedman hosted at his house, I recall the words that he said that evening uh, more than three and a half years ago now. Uh, he said that he likens his job to the job of the Kohen, the priest, who would walk and work in the temple. And uh, there are many actions that one can do in the temple. One, the Mizbeach, the altar, does not have steps, it has a ramp. And the reason why it has a ramp is because if you are not walking up a ramp, you are sliding down that ramp. It's not stairs. You can't level off. You can't pause. You can't uh, enjoy the accomplishments that you've had. Uh, we have not waited a single day to, to look at our accomplishments. And I would encourage the next administration not to pause. It's everybody's job. Uh, in a relationship to keep growing. I've never once looked at my wife and said, wow, we made it to here, let's just coast. Uh, that's not what you do with something that you care about. The U.S.-Israel relationship is something that so many of us care about. We're on a ramp. We must keep pushing forward. So there's nothing eternal. Uh, every administration, uh, whether they sit in the Oval Office or they sit in Balfour, has an obligation to grow and nurture this relationship because if not, by definition, it will atrophy. Are you worried? I'm always worried. But I'm not worried specifically about politics. I'm worried because it's out of my hands. It's out of Ambassador Friedman's hands. It's out of Jared's hands and Pompeo's hands and, and Berkowitz's hands. And, and these are hands that I know well. Uh, I'm optimistic. And the word I like to use is prayerful that every U.S. administration will nurture and care for this special relationship because it is a quintessential American value to stand shoulder to shoulder with Israel. And I will support and root for Every administration that will do that and administrations that don't do that uh, will disagree on policy and will probably disagree publicly on policy. But I will never once, not ever, uh, speak about a person and disparage them uh, for their beliefs. Uh, this has to be policy. If we want to bring this back to the bipartisan um, fulcrum that is necessary to continue to develop this relationship, uh, we need to disagree on policy, but not disagree on personality. And uh, I'm optimistic that we'll get there. I'm not optimistic we'll get there quickly, but I'm optimistic that we'll get there. So many of our viewers would like to understand what exactly really happened with the idea of sovereignty, uh, the so-called annexation. Yeah, now, uh, you know, history books will be written about the last uh, year. Uh, some positive, some negative. Uh, we're almost at the year anniversary of President Trump releasing the vision for peace in the White House on January 28th. Uh, there were several Arab countries who were there, most notably uh, the United Arab Emirates and Bahrain, uh, who came out in support, not necessarily of the plan, but of the prospect of there being a plan. Uh, and since that moment, uh, there's been uh, opportunity, responsibility, uh, confusion, and discussion. Um, what winds up happening is when people start making this a personality issue or a political issue, and then they've lost track of the plan. Uh, it's a detailed plan. It's a complex plan. Uh, I encourage everybody to read it. Uh, I think it's a fair plan. I think it's a realistic plan. The plan was not accepted. Uh, Israel is willing to negotiate on the basis of the plan. And uh, I think that's a good decision by Israel. But the, the, the number one premise of sovereignty that this administration has given to Israel is that Israel is a sovereign nation capable of making its own decisions. Uh, the United States of America has presented options uh, to Israel. And Israel has elected by your very robust democracy, um, very robust democracy. Perhaps you guys should be a little bit less robust uh, and <laughs> let governments work for a little bit. But uh, uh, you guys have elected leaders. You have excellent elected leaders and they make decisions. None of them are easy decisions. Um, these are all challenging. When, when the prime minister or the alternate prime minister or the defense minister uh, or foreign minister have to make the decisions, uh, sovereignty is one of those decisions. 
But there's a whole slew of other data points that come into that. One of them is how the United States of America will react. But it's not the only data point. Uh, it's really not. Uh, and, uh, and therefore, I think that this advanced the conversation in a meaningful way. I think that all people in the region will benefit from having had this robust conversation. I think the robust conversation needs to continue. Uh, I don't think there's any doubt uh, that the opportunity of the Abraham Accords has given Israel the moment to be able to um, negate uh, one of the biggest uh, misnomers. I mean, misnomer might be the incorrect word, uh, but one of the greater fallacies that the Palestinians have a right to veto progress in the region. And they don't have a right to veto progress in the region. And the Abraham Accords have demonstrated that. Prime Minister Netanyahu said some fascinating, Jared Kushner was here, said that the Abraham Accords have now given space for Israeli Arabs to further uh, connect to the broader Israeli society. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful that that's the case. As your ally, uh, we see that, that, that your country is incredible, it's inspiring, it's miraculous, but can be fractious. And, and the more your country comes together, the safer and more secure the United States of America is. So if the Abraham Accords play, play just a role in that, I would say Dayenu. Uh, the fact that the Abraham Accords is going to provide unprecedented economic opportunities coming out of COVID-19, Dayenu. The fact that the Abraham Accords strengthens the region against your nemesis, Dayenu. There are many benefits to this. Um, and the fact that sovereignty for Judea and Samaria was not taken off the table, but the word that was used was paused. Also, Dayenu, this is a very exciting time to be in this region. And the one thing I will unequivocally say is that this region is safer, more secure, and more prosperous today than it was when we picked it up four years ago. And, and that credit goes to the president, but to the secretary, Ambassador Friedman, Jared, et cetera. Now, regarding the Abraham Accords, what's your message to the next administration are there really countries that are, you know, waiting in line? Yeah, the, the answer, and we were asked this uh, fairly frequently prior to the elections. There was a question of, uh, was this country going to join three days before the elections or two days before the elections? And I'm talking about the American elections at this point in time. Uh, and, and I was insulted by that question, not personally, but uh, from a policy perspective. Uh, peace doesn't know politics. Peace is not a Republican ideal. Peace is not a Democratic ideal. Peace is a United States ideal, but it's really a mankind ideal or a humankind ideal. Peace doesn't, should not be bound by our electoral cycle or by Republicans or Democrats. And, and the challenge to the United States of America is very simple. Uh, again, choose policy above politics. I believe that the people who are going to run the country will make that decision. I believe that the American people will make that decision. I know the people of this region have already made that decision. They voted uh, with their feet. They did not care who was running the White House, they have run towards peace. Uh, it, it is incomprehensible to me that the United States of America, regardless of who is in charge, uh, will not embrace people running towards peace. So finally, tell us which countries are waiting in line. On August 13th, uh, when the first phone call was made in between MBZ, uh, Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed, Prime Minister Netanyahu and President Trump, it shocked the world because nobody knew about it. Why did we like to shock the world? A, it was fun, but more important than it being fun, it gave space for those countries to be able to have negotiations without negotiating through the press, without negotiating through rumor mills, without having to be responsive to the street, mythical or not. Uh, there are plenty of people who talk about other countries in line. The easiest way to say is every country is in line. Uh, but to share information that I have about countries who are significantly considering doing this is doing a disservice towards peace. Uh, and I will make this comment towards uh, towards members of, of your uh, industry. Uh, I had hoped at some point in time that Israeli journalists would, would hearken to the call of Tzionut, of Zionism, and think once or twice about whether or not something that they were publishing would advance the cause of their state or not. And, uh, and I guess I was disappointed uh, because I've sacrificed my career and my living to be able to work to advance the cause of the United States of America. I have seen some articles where I know that intelligent journalists know that by publishing that, they've diminished the opportunity for peace and not enhanced it. You're relating to the publication of uh, Netanyahu's visit, the secret visit, to Saudi Arabia. I won't get involved with any of the examples because I respect the industry as a whole. I would tell you that I think individuals 
uh, have to feel a responsibility. I'll, I'll give you just one more example of that. The responsibility belongs to the media, but the responsibility belongs to every Israeli citizen. Uh, when Israelis travel to the United Arab Emirates, they become ambassadors of the Jewish state. Israeli Arabs or Israeli Jews or Israeli Christians, when they show up, that is the first Israeli in all likelihood that the cab driver, the hotel person, the business person, uh, the restauranteur is going to interact with. They have a history of this not being a normalized relationship. Let me know what type of Zionist attitude one has in terms of how likely you are going to promote their desire to get closer to the state of Israel. At the end of the day, peace is going to be dependent on the people. And I would recommend that the Israeli people embrace this as a challenge and as an opportunity. Uh, don't treat the UAE or Bahrain or Morocco or Sudan as Las Vegas to, as a thing. It's not a place where you just run to and assume that you're uh, participating in anonymity. Uh, it's a place that when you visit, you should visit with responsibility and opportunity. And I have made the same exact speech and comment to our Emirati friends and our Bahraini friends and our Moroccan friends when they come here. Uh, let's not be so 21st century where we just assume everything is forgiven. Let's be a little bit more old fashioned and understand that our first impressions may very well be our last impressions and take that upon ourselves as serious human beings and citizens of our countries. So I challenge the media to do that and I challenge the vacationers to do that as well as the business people. So Arya Lightstone, Rabbi Arya Lightstone, what's next for you? So I'll tell you the following thing. You say rabbi and normally, again, I haven't served in this position in a rabbinic capacity. I've served as the chief of staff. I've served as a senior advisor. I've served as the head of the Abraham Fund, and I've served most recently as a special envoy for economic normalization. I've never served as a rabbi here, but uh, you, your audience, your readers, your listeners, I think will appreciate this. Um, you always wonder how you will react at Ni'ila of Yom Kippur as the day ends. How seriously is your tshuva? How serious is your repentance? How serious do you truly take this process and this day? Uh, my Yom Kippur that I will experience next year, please God, making it to that point in time, will be different. Because from the moment that we realized that President Trump was not going to have a second term, uh, I have not measured my days in days. I've measured them in 15-minute increments. And my to-do list has gotten longer, and my passion for checking things off of that to-do list has gotten greater. Uh, when you have the single greatest job that you will likely ever have in your life, and you have it for a limited period of time, the question of what I'll do on January 21st is a question I'll start answering on January 22nd. Uh, I decided early on, I think it was in July of this year, that I can spend some time figuring out what our family will do after this, or I can spend time making sure that every moment of this job is used to the maximum for the gifts that God has given me and the trust and faith that Ambassador Fred Friedman has placed in me. Uh, I made the decision with my wife's support uh, to work this job to the very last minute. Um, my hope is that in a transition, they'll pick up the ball with where we left it and they will run harder and faster uh, than we did. Okay, Ari Lightstone, until yesterday, the Chief of Staff of U.S. Ambassador to Israel, David Friedman, thank you very much for joining us. Good luck. Thank you so much. Uh, wish you and the entire state of Israel health, security, uh, and continued friendship with the greatest country in the history of the world, the United States of America. Thank you. Thank you.